Good morning. I took notes though. I'm Debbie Schrager. I'm going to take my glasses so I can see my notes. Uh, Director of Georgetown Law Supreme Court Institute. I'd like to welcome everyone to our annual term preview. And it's great to see members of the Supreme Court press back on campus. And thank you very much to those reporters who are joining us remotely. Founded in 1999, the Supreme Court Institute offers programming focused on the court the centerpiece of which is our moot court program. SEI offers its moot courts as a public service at no charge and irrespective of positions taken by counsel, reflecting our core commitment to the quality of Supreme Court advocacy in all cases. Jesus. Last term, we hosted moot courts for at least one side of every case on the merits docket, and we are looking forward to assisting many advocates in the upcoming, upcoming October term 2022. I'd like to remind everyone that this discussion is being streamed live on the law school's YouTube channel, and a recording will also be available on YouTube. Thank you to everyone who has joined us remotely. I would also like to thank Georgetown's communications event and AV staffs for making this event possible. The moderator for today's discussion is the Supreme Court Institute's executive director, and Georgetown Law Professor Irv Gornstein. <clears throat> professor Gornstein was both an assistant and counselor to the U.S. Solicitor General. During his many years of government service, he argued 38 cases before the United States Supreme Court. Professor Gornstein. Do you want me to do okay. Welcome everybody, both those who are in person and those who are streaming this event. Uh, I'll start off with my usual uh, summary of last term and how we should look forward to this term. Last term will be forever remembered as the term the court overruled Roe against Wade. For many, that was a cause for great celebration. For many others, it shattered their faith in the Supreme Court. Inside the court, Dobbs has provoked a deeply divisive debate on what it means for the court to act with legitimacy. And that internal debate has seeped out into the justices' public comments. Because of the singular confluence of forces that led to Dobbs, I don't think it tells us all that much about how the court will generally decide cases going forward. For that, the rest of the cases on last term's DACA tell us far more. And there we saw a solid conservative majority moving the court firmly in a rightward direction. In most of the high profile cases besides Dobbs, we saw six three decisions with Republican appointed justices on one side and Democratic appointed justices on the other. There's no reason to think this coming term or any term in the foreseeable future will be any different on things that matter most, get ready for a lot of six threes. But that does not mean that every high pro profile case will go that way. Three justices were prepared to compel the Navy to send unvaccinated Navy SEALs into combat, combat, to have a federal district court supervise the State Department to make sure it is engaging in good faith negotiations with Mexico, and to prevent the federal government from establishing conditions to ensure that federally funded hospitals don't kill their patients. But none of those positions commanded a majority, and I suspect that similarly ex extreme and common sense defying positions will meet the same fate in the future. Finally, we've known for some time that the court was headed in a rightward direction with the only questions being how far and how fast. Last term tells us the answer depends on Justice Kavanaugh. Because the Chief Justice is slightly to the left of him and Justice Barrett is slightly to the right, Justice Kavanaugh is the median justice. While Justice Kavanaugh largely voted with the conservative majority last term, he and the Chief Justice joined the left side of the court to produce five four decisions in five cases. And Justice Kavanaugh is also becoming famous or infamous, depending on your point of view, for writing concurring opinions that declare the limits of right side majority decisions. Is there an 
unenumerated right to travel to get an abortion? Yes. Can states impose licensing restrictions on gun ownership like the ones in 30, 43 states, even though such restrictions first appeared in the 20th century? Yes. Make no mistake, for now and the foreseeable future, this is Justice Kavanaugh's court. This term will be a good test on where he and the court are headed because there are already a number of high profile cases and some fairly important ones underneath those. To discuss some of those cases, we have an all-star panel who will present their cases in this order. Roman Martinez from Latham Watkins, Kelsey Corcoran from Georgetown's Institute for Constitutional Advocacy and Protection, Hash Mupan, from Jones Day, and Lisa Blatt from Williams and Connolly, and I'll go last. Uh, before getting started, I want to make everyone aware that the positions taken today by our all-star panel do not represent the views of their firms or their other affiliations. Let me quickly review the rules. One of our panelists will introduce a case when the presentation is complete. I'll invite other panelists to comment on the case. And when that discussion is complete, I will invite press questions on that case. We'll start with Roman, who has the affirmative action cases. Great, uh, thank you, Irv. And, and uh, thanks to all of you for coming and thanks to Georgetown for uh, having us and always good to be with my fellow panelists here. I'm gonna talk just briefly about the two uh, affirmative action cases that are at the court, uh, both of which in involve the same challenger, Students for Fair Admissions, uh, and the oldest uh, private university and public university in the country, uh, Harvard and the University of North Carolina. These are two cases um, that were gonna be joined up for argument, but now are gonna be separated. Um, and the cases are gonna be argued at the end of October on, uh, on Halloween. The questions presented in both cases are basically the same. Uh, the first question is whether the Supreme Court should overrule the Grutter decision uh, and hold that institutions of higher education can't use race as a factor in admissions. And the second question is even if Grutter is not overruled, uh, whether under existing precedent, the admissions programs of both universities uh, pass muster under Grutter's uh, test. And Grutter, of course, was the decision uh, following on the Backey decision from the 1970s, Grutter recognized that diversity uh, can be a compelling interest that institutions of higher education are allowed to pursue um, and, and therefore can take race into account for the purposes of promoting educational diversity. In both cases, uh, Harvard and North Carolina uh, have admissions policies that they describe as holistic review policies where they take race into account along with a wide range of other factors when assessing who should be uh, admitted into their programs. The basic arguments, uh, and, and in both cases, the lower courts upheld uh, the university positions and uh, students for uh, fair admissions uh, sought cert. And in, in, the, uh, in the North Carolina case, I think they got cert before judgment. So the basic arguments in the Supreme Court are fairly straightforward in the sense that we've seen uh, a lot of these arguments in, in affirmative action cases in the past. The, the primary argument that, that uh, Student for Fair Admissions is, is, uh, is putting forward is the idea that Grutter should be overruled. Um, and the, the, uh, the challengers essentially argue that the Constitution and the Equal Protection Clause are colorblind, that that was essentially the rule that should have been uh, upheld in, in uh, Plessy versus Ferguson. Instead, Justice Harlan's position that the Constitution was colorblind, colorblind did not prevail. Um, according to the challengers, that position did prevail in Brown versus Board of Education. And they rely a lot on Brown versus Board of Education as interpreted through the lens of the Supreme Court's de uh, decision, and in particular, the Chief Justice's uh, opinion in the parents involved case about 15 years ago, which reads Brown uh, very strongly as adopting a, a sort of colorblind theory of the Constitution. And so the challengers say Grutter should be uh, overruled um, and, uh, and, and the, the government, uh, whether it's under the Equal Protection Clause or under Title VI, which incorporates Equal Protection Clause standards, essentially means that, that uh, government-run universities, or in Harvard's case, because it's subject to Title, title VI, because it receives federal funds, cannot use race as a factor. 
When they argue for Grutter to be overruled, the main arguments are that Grutter was uh, grievously wrong. Uh, it departs from the original meaning of the 14th Amendment text, which contains no exceptions for sort of good use of race as opposed to bad uses of race. Uh, it's intention or contradicts decisions like Brown. It had no, uh, Grutter's uh, rule of, uh, allowing consideration of race had no legal foundations and has no true defenders because really the challengers say uh, the, the, whole, the real purpose and the real goal uh, motivating these affirmative action policies is not so much pr pr promoting educational diversity in the classroom, but rather remedying uh, societal discrimination, which has not been allowed uh, in other cases. And so the challengers say that in addition to Grutter being grievously or egregiously wrong, they say that there are significant negative consequences uh, that come from Grutter, inc including that it's le uh, legally unworkable in practice, that there are bad legal uh, real world consequences of uh, creating stereotyping and treating people on the basis of their race instead of their individual characteristics. And they say that the decision has not generated legitimate reliance interests for a number of reasons, including the fact that Grutter itself seemed to build in a 25 year uh, expectation or hope that, uh, that 25 years after Grutter, there would be no need for, for these kinds of programs anymore. In addition, the challengers say that both programs fail strict scrutiny, um, even under the existing framework, and they emphasize what uh, evidence that, that in the challengers' minds shows that both uh, universities essentially end up discriminating against Asian Americans in admission. Uh, in Harvard's case, they, uh, the challengers emphasize data showing that Asian Americans are evaluated very negatively under the personal qualities um, portion of, of the admissions assessment, um, which, which the challengers suggest is intended to compensate for Asian Americans' very high performance on other areas like academic uh, test scores and grades. Um, on the other side, the, the Harvard and the University of North Carolina uh, have a robust defense of, uh, of Bakke, Grutter, and subsequent decisions that have applied Grutter. And they basically say that those decisions are consistent with the text and history of the 14th Amendment. They point to um, laws and policies enacted around the time of the 14th Amendment that gave uh, preferences based on race in certain programs, especially to former slaves, but not just to former slaves in the mid 19th century. And they say that, that, uh, that the constitution doesn't prohibit those kinds of preferences. They emphasize the positive consequences of diversity in the classroom and in society more generally. And they emphasize the fact that these programs and, and the constitutionality of these programs have been widely relied upon. They also, in, uh, with respect to the strict scrutiny analysis, even under existing precedent, the universities emphasize that, that there is no evidence of uh, widespread discrimination, and there's a lot of back and forth in the briefing about a lot of the statistics and the data, especially in the Harvard case. So those are the basic arguments. Um, I'll just make a couple of comments about the case, because um, I think it is, it's a case that sort of uniquely implicates a lot of the major themes that, uh, that folks have been thinking about and focusing on when thinking about this current court. Uh, first of all, it sort of intersects with the comments Irv was making about a 6-3 conservative dominated court. Um, the, the Supreme Court, as, as everyone knows, has grappled with this question of affirmative action in higher education and the permissible uses of race for many years. Um, but the, the court is more conservative now than it has been in any of these decades since Bakke. And I think, you know, if you were just trying to count noses, I think you would think that uh, there are more votes to be skeptical of these programs now than ever before. In a lot of the earlier cases, you had a Justice Kennedy or Justice Kennedy and Justice O'Connor sort of in the middle and willing to try to muddle through a, a sort of middle ground solution. It's not clear that that middle ground will prevail here. Another theme that people talk about a lot with respect to the current court is the role of the chief justice. And as everyone knows, in recent years, the chief justice has played a sort of mediating role in the middle of the court and has tried to, uh, to push for narrower rulings and has tried to be, or has been less willing to overturn precedent in order to get there and more willing to uphold existing precedent. I think this might be a case that challenges that view of the chief. Uh, the chief has been, uh, as, as a number of commentators have noted throughout his career, uh, both before and after joining the bench, he has focused on this idea of a colorblind constitution as being very important to him. He wrote the parents involved decision. He famously wrote that the way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. And in past cases, he's been skeptical of Grutter's diversity rationale. So this might be a case in which the chief doesn't play that sort of mediating role in the middle, 
And it could give rise to a sort of narrative that the chief, after, after being on his own in the Dobbs decision last term, might actually be sort of leading the court um, in uh, this year uh, with respect to this issue in, in this case, which will be inevitably be one of the biggest cases on the docket. Uh, this case also implicates important questions about precedent, when precedent should be overruled. Uh, it seems that the current approach on the court, uh, I think most clearly illustrated by last term's decision in Dobbs, but actually I think it's an approach that has generally uh, been adopted and applied by all the justices, uh, including uh, justice, all, all, all eight justices that we've seen before. We'll see what Justice Jackson has to say about it. But I think all the justices these days tend to uh, be willing to overturn precedent if they think the precedent is egregiously wrong and they think the issue is sufficiently important and that that the uh, the sort of costs and benefits in a prudential way sort of favor overturning it. I don't think there's um, a wing of the court that is sort of categorically committed to upholding precedent at all, at all costs. Um, and I think that this case will implicate that sort of debate about precedent. Uh, originalism this is a tricky case based, based on originalism. I think one of the notable things in the briefing, especially on the challenger side, is that although they invoke um, the original meaning of the text of the 14th Amendment, the brief is surprisingly uh, light on, on historical analysis or even you know, very detailed textual analysis and relies a lot on precedent. And in particular, uh, it seems to be trying to take as given the Chief Justice's analysis uh, in, parent, in the parents involved decision that the Constitution is, in, is colorblind and that that's how Brown versus Board of Education should be read. So although this case does implicate originalism, um, it seems like the more real estate, the most real estate in the briefs is uh, on, on original meaning and original understanding and original intent is really, uh, is, is really given by in the briefs that were filed by the universities, not by the challengers. I thought that was an interesting point. The final thing I'll say very quickly, this case imp implicates sort of questions about uh, whether the court should be issuing broad decisions or narrow decisions. Um, I do think there are some options that the court has. Even if you think that this court might be willing to strike down Grutter, I think that there are options about exactly how it does so and, and what it, exactly it says. And it could have very important implications for the future of uh, efforts to promote diversity and promote um, uh, equal opportunity across uh, races and ethnicities in education. Uh, it's possible that the court could have a very categorical rule that race can never be considered in any way, implicitly or explicitly. It's also possible that the court could do something a little bit more modest that prohibits race from being expressly relied on as a factor, but does allow other types of, of uh, admissions programs that are adopted in part out of a desire to promote diversity, but do not uh, directly look at race. For example, programs that allow um, you know, the top 10% of uh, high school graduates to get into a, a university or programs that focus on socioeconomic diversity directly, but that will have spillover implications for the racial makeup of a class. Um, I will leave it at that. I think it'll be a very interesting case to watch and an interesting oral argument on October 31st. Thanks so much, Roman. Others, um, I invite comments. I'll just pick up on one, the last thing that Roman said, which is one other sort of off-ramp in the case, potentially, is to not even decide it on constitutional grounds. You know, there's an argument been made, and I think some of you have written articles about this, that, uh, you know, these cases, especially the Harvard cases, it's coming up not directly as a constitutional challenge. It's coming up under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act because Harvard's a private university, which isn't actually bound by the Constitution, but it does receive federal funds. And because it receives federal funds, it can't engage in discrimination on the basis of the race. Uh, in Grutter and some past cases, the court has conflated those two and said that Title VI is prohibition on discrimination based on race is coterminous with the Equal Protection Clause. You know, there are arguments that have been made and could be made that that's not right. Uh, and while the challengers aren't arguing it, you know, you could see the court potentially thinking that resolving the case on statutory grounds in some ways is a narrower decision because it leaves open whether Congress could change the statute and what the Constitution means. In some ways, it's arguably a broader ground because just reading the statute to say no discrimination on the basis of race means no discrimination on the basis of race would sort of take off the table some of the middle ground appro approaches that Ramon had highlighted. But I think that's one thing to keep your eye on is whether there's any interest on the statutory ground. And, and just to jump in one, one additional point, which is interesting to remember and think about on the statutory argument, this, the statutory argument was resolved in Baki. And it was resolved uh, in a way that, that essentially said, well, this, we'll, we'll just read the statute to track the Equal Protection Clause standard, despite 
uh, some of its language, which seems to be more direct and more directly, you know, uh, helpful, I think, to challengers to these types of programs. It's interesting that in, in that Baki uh, case, four justices, there was a four justice dissent that was written by Justice Stevens um, that would have read the text of, of Title VI in a way that would help the challengers here and essentially say that, no, the, the language of the statute prohibits the use of race. And so it's interesting to see how the, uh, the views on these issues have evolved over time. Yes, yeah, so I have a totally different perspective, um, which is not doctrinal or based on precedent, but the way I see the court acting on these big issues that affect society and just sort of from a common sense standpoint, I think the court, the current court is just tired of having someone like Justice Powell or Justice O'Connor or Justice Kennedy set policy on a national level. And that's what we have here. There's a disconnect between the law that says you can have affirmative action only for diversity, um, but you can't use quotas, but you still have to show the benefit of your diversity policy, but you can't use quotas to get there. Mm -hmm. And it puts these uh, defenders of affirmative action in an impossible situation because they have to rely on racial stereotypes to get there and say, well, we need people of a certain race to promote diversity. And that's just not a great position to take um, is suggesting that there's something about someone's color that represents something that would help society in a classroom and how you break that down, which how many people in a classroom and does it matter if they're all in liberal arts or they're all in engineering. And so eventually the discussion about affirmative action just breaks down to a discussion where you don't need to know any law. You're just arguing about what you think about what it means to have, you know, considerations of race and admission. The other thing I would say about it is, I think that this is uh, goes to some broader questions about, um, you know, the way diversity is used in a private setting, and I wouldn't see some some follow on if assuming that uh, Grutter is overruled, some follow on litigation about how much private companies can discriminate for diversity. And finally, I'm gonna make a counterpoint as a public school student. I've always seen this case as upside down. It seems to me the discrimination by, or alleged discrimination by Harvard is way more pernicious than that by the state. And one would think that state action would be way more uh, objectionable. But as somebody who went to a state school, uh, that was largely white. I think states have a greater interest in their state schools promoting diversity than someone like Harvard that has its pick. And there's something, I don't know, a little bit elitist about hearing from Ivy League schools about you know, their ability to make these distinctions when they can get anyone they want. I will just make a very small point that popped into my head while Hush was talking about the narrow statutory ground. It, it, it strikes me that although I agree that there's something attractive about that, we have seen in other contexts. Oh, oh okay. Yes, that is much louder, sorry. Um, uh, what I was saying is just uh, thinking about the, the, the narrower statutory ground, um, uh, kind of this spending clause uh, piece of it, we have seen in other contexts that this court is skeptical of uh, the federal government using that kind of spending uh, power to regulate states. So in the Cummings case last term, um, where the court, uh, uh, I think probably folks are familiar with it, um, where the court said no uh, emotional damages under the Rehab Act because uh, of the kind of, the, the, the you wouldn't imply uh, into the, the statutory provision uh, a right to regulate states in that way. So um, I, I think, and then there's gonna be another case I think argued in November involving section 1983 a uh, cause of action uh, raising similar issues. So I I'll be curious to see whether the co court finds that attractive, whether it's kind of gonna distinguish the situations where there's a federalism problem with reading um, uh, statutes that way and when there isn't. Questions from the press. Um, that, uh, I'm sorry, do you think that the chiefs um, is the only one who would be reluctant to overturn precedent here if you think he is, or do you think that there are other conservative justices who would want to find a narrow, uh, narrower way out? Yeah, I think the chief will, is, will sort of be torn between his, his longstanding, you know, constitutionist colorblind views that he's articulated over, over again and his sort of impulse to be narrower and not overturn precedent. 
beyond him, the one that, that I know sort of firsthand a little bit uh, about that I think is sort of an interesting case is Justice Kavanaugh. Uh, I think if you look at some of these, I think there were emails or writings or something that came out during his confirmation where, you know, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, he was expressing skepticism of some affirmative action type programs. If you look at what he's done in his own chambers, in his own hiring practice, uh, Justice Kavanaugh has a very impressive track record of hiring um, a very diverse range of law clerks, which is the, the kind of the key thing that judges and justices hire. Um, and so, you know, he has spoken about uh, viewing that kind of diversity as important. It's something he's very proud of. Um, and so I think that's something that he will have to think about and could give him some pause. I don't know whether it will have an ultimate effect on how he des des uh, decides the case, but I will say that I think, you know, he maybe more so than other justices really thought a lot about this diversity question in sort of their, his day-to-day -day practice. Yeah, um, I was wondering if um, the last time the court split cases that it initially was going to hear together was in the um, uh, the election case a couple of years ago when, when Justice Sotomayor was out. And in that case, the court ended up issuing its opinion in the main opinion in the one and then in the other was just basically see the first one. Are you expecting the same thing here that the North Carolina decision will be the decision that speaks for the court and then the Harvard will going to be a little hard look maybe on the primary issue of overall and grutter but if the harvard case the sort of fact specific arguments in the harvard case are pretty significant right the the, the you know arguments about discrimination against asians like you can't really resolve that in the unc case in any meaningful way so they're gonna have to do at least that piece of the case for real in the actual harvard case with an a justice court but the overall and grutter part i'm sure that will do in the unc opinion but, Hash, I wonder if, if they say you can't use race in oh, North sure. Carolina, then they can just, they can duck out of the Asian American question in Harvard because it's reversed because they use, admittedly use race. Uh, look, probably, you know, theoretically, the, uh, the challenger should be entitled to relief with respect to the personality scores wholly apart from overruling runner. But I, I suppose that's right. Other questions from the press on Harvard. So I, I just want to tee up one question before we leave this is, is I think Lisa teed up, but I wanted to get other people's views, which is if this comes out the way we think it will, then is next term the overruling of Weber? And does anybody- have to remind everyone what that is. Hmm? Oh, yes, that's the decision that allows private employers to use affirmative action in hiring. So does anybody have a view on that or? I have a view that it'll be litigated. <laughs> um, I think, you know, I, th I think that Weber's Title VII, right? Yep. Yes. Yeah. So, so I think that, you know, the, there, there are different approaches to precedent when it comes to statutory precedents. And so in theory, the, the, the doctrine on precedent would say that, that uh, constitutional precedents are more readily overruled, even under a, a somewhat, a, you know, a high standard for uh, a, a threshold you have to clear. Statutory precedents even harder to overrule. On the other hand, you know, as Hosh said, you might get a flavor of a sort of statutory argument or some things that are said about this Title VI in this case. Um, and I think that that could have implications. I do think there, the issues are distinct, but obviously if, if the trend is going in a certain direction, I think people will will litigants will bring those types of claims and then we'll just have to see what the court says in, in this case and how it affects that analysis. So I was wondering just um, um, about your last point. Do you, you um, and I think I agree with this, um, think that at least in constitutional cases, the question is just, if the question is important enough, uh, the answer is how wrong is the decision? And um, since this group of justices feels pretty confident in their judgments about how wrong a decision is. Um, they go from wrong to very wrong pretty quickly. Um, it really boils down to uh, wrongness on important issues. Do you think that there is going to be a distinction drawn going forward between constitutional and statutory cases when it comes to stare decisis? I do think so. Um, on the constitutional standard, I think I do agree that that if it's really if, if people think it's really wrong, I think they are 
uh, seriously open to reconsidering precedent. I, uh, I think that's true. Uh, I don't know, Irv, if you meant to imply that only some, some justices applied that approach. No, no, I, I I not you, at all. Yeah, um, okay. Right. I think that's basically the, the common approach. I do think it's not just whether it's really wrong. I think people need to think it's, it's also pretty important. And then I think yeah. there's also practical and prudential considerations that they would take seriously. Um, but I do think that the dif distinction between constitutional and statutory precedents is likely to continue. Um, in, uh, and, and that'll still be a distinction. But, you know, as you say, uh, you know, maybe not. Who knows? We'll have to see. Yeah, look, I, I do think m almost all the justices are generally of the view that even if you hold the level of wrongness equal, there's a reason not to overrule a statutory case because they're not the last word. Right, Congress can always, at least theoretically, fix it. That makes some amount of sense. Now, I think you know the subject matter uh, can affect just how wrong they think it is. And even for statutory cases, you get to some point where it's just untenably wrong, and then they will overrule it. I think that it's sort of going back to what Ramon said. A lot of it's going to turn on how they write this opinion because they could write it in ways that don't really tee up that Weber is not just wrong, but like indefensibly wrong, or they could write it in ways that really make it very hard to justify Weber on a going forward basis. And so a lot will turn on how it writes. Right. And I think stacking Weber up against cases like Bostock, another statutory case, you know, if you look at the interpretive methodology in those cases, it's very, very different. Um, and so the kind of textualist, literalist, more, more literal, literalist, textualist approach from Bostock, from uh, Justice Gorsuch's opinion, I think, you know, if you if you applied that approach across the civil rights statutes, you, you know you might have to re-examine a bunch of precedents. Uh, I'll say one last real quick thing because the DC Circuit on Bonk actually just a couple of maybe a month or so ago just actually overturned a statutory Title VII holding in a way that was pro-employee on essentially exactly these reasons. Right? There was an old set of DC Circuit cases that were adverse to employees but not at all textually grounded, and the. DC Circuit flipped it and basically said, that's just not how we interpret statutes anymore. All right, um, Kelsey, you have 303 Creative. Yeah, so this is 303 Creative v. Alanis. Uh, the plaintiffs in this case are a woman named Lori Smith and her website design company, 303 Creative. They are challenging a Colorado public accommodations law that like most states uh, have, uh, it prohibits places of business that sell to the public from discriminating in their sales based on protected characteristics, which include disability, race, national origin, uh, religion, and most importantly for this case, um, sexual orientation. So um, Smith would like to expand her design services to include wedding websites, but only for opposite sex couples. She is opposed to same sex marriage on religious grounds. So she filed a pre-enforcement challenge seeking an injunction prohibiting uh, Colorado from enforcing the law against her on the ground that requiring her to serve same-sex couples would violate both her free speech rights and also her free exercise rights under the First Amendment. So if any of this sounds familiar from past Supreme Court terms, you're thinking of Masterpiece Cake Shop from 2018. Uh, that case, uh, in, in that case, the Colorado officials had determined that the bakery owner, a man named Jack Phillips, had violated the Colorado law by refusing to sell a wedding cake to a same-sex couple. Um, so like Smith, Phillips argued uh, that the law violated his free speech and free exercise rights. Uh, and in an opinion by Justice Kennedy, the court ruled very narrowly that Colorado had violated Phillips' religious exercise rights by selectively enforcing the law against him in a way uh, that exhibited hostility towards his religious beliefs. Uh, and so the court relied pretty heavily on statements made by uh, state officials at public hearings, which the court said cast doubt on the fairness and impartiality of the way that the state was enforcing the law. So that was the extent of the masterpiece decision. The court did not uh, make any more general rulings about the constitutionality of the Colorado law. So this case is the follow-up effort to get that broader ruling. And obviously we've got a, a different court now than we had in 2018 when Justice Kennedy was uh, the swing vote. Um, so, uh, and it, the court made an interesting decision though when it granted review, the petition asked the court to uh, review both Smith's uh, free exercise challenge and her free speech challenge. The court limited the grant 
to Smith's free speech claim, and we can maybe talk in our discussion about why it, it did that. Uh, so the case is now fully briefed and expected to be scheduled for oral argument uh, in December. So I'll make a, a few observations just based on my reading of the, of the briefing. Uh, so first, although the, the parties agree that creating websites is creative expression, they fundamentally disagree about whether the Colorado law regulates that expression. Um, so the state characterizes the law as a prohibition on discriminatory sales practices that leaves businesses entirely free to choose what products and services they offer for public sale. So a particularly important example the state gives, if Smith wanted to sell only wedding websites that include biblical quotes or affirmatively state that marriage is between a man and a woman, she can do that. She can insist that every one of her wedding websites states that marriage is between a man and a woman. What she can't do is tell a same-sex couple they can't purchase that website. Um, right Now, why would a same-sex couple want to purchase that website? I don't know. Um, but the point is that the, uh, the, the law is regulating the sales, discriminatory sales, not the actual content of what Smith is selling. Um, uh, and so uh, the, the distinction the state is drawing, I think um, we can see in other contexts, right? So uh, there are lots of, of creative um, uh, uh, businesses, so for instance, an author who writes a book. Um, I don't think anyone disagrees that the content, the crea creative expression of the book is First Amendment protected. However, once an author publishes a book, uh, they can't tell Amazon to only sell it to people of a certain race uh, or a, a certain religion, right? So sales versus creation. Um, Smith does not disagree with that distinction in the context of off-the-shelf products. She's arguing that this situation is different because she plans to customize her services for each buyer. And that customization process is itself creative expression. And in particular, she alleges that as part of her wedding website services, she's going to write a celebratory narrative of each couple's unique love story. So she says that she has a First Amendment right not to create uh, that narrative for a same-sex couple. Um, Smith also notes that she will serve same-sex couples and gay and lesbian people who ask her to design websites uh, expressing messages she agrees with. The example she gives is uh, advertising uh, an animal rescue shelter. Um, so she says this shows that she's not, um, her refusal to make same-sex uh, wedding websites isn't discrimination based on the person's status. It's based on the message that they're asking her to endorse. Uh, the Solicitor General filed a brief uh, in support of Colorado, uh, and that brief emphasizes the breadth of the injunction that Smith seeks. So she's seeking a categorical exemption to the accommodations law that would allow her to state uh, on her website and in her advertising that she does not provide any wedding websites for same-sex couples. Um, so that would include not only the service of writing the couple's love story, which does sound pretty expressive, but also, for example, a fill-in-the-blank template website um, where the customization is limited to filling in the couple's names, date, location of the wedding, uh, and that doesn't seem as expressive. Um, Smith's response to that argument is that she just doesn't plan to uh, provide fill-in-the-blank websites, so it's not going to be an issue. And I think that highlights another lurking issue in this case, um, which is whether it, it, the dispute is ripe for adjudication right now. Um, recall that in Masterpiece, a, a same-sex couple had asked Phillips to, for a wedding cake, he had refused, and the couple had filed a complaint with state officials, and they had found him in violation of the accommodations law. Here, the state has never sought to enforce the law against Smith. She hasn't even offered wedding websites for public sale yet. The lawsuit's seeking a pre-enforcement injunction based on Smith's description of what she wants to do in the future. Um, so if she gets that injunction and is allowed to advertise that she doesn't provide wedding website services for same-sex couples, it would seem that it would allow her to refuse um, to sell even kind of the non-creative pieces of that service as well. Um, but it's all hypothetical at this point. So there's a possibility that when the court digs into the case, it decides uh, that these issues can't be resolved without a more developed factual record. Um, we'll see. I don't think, I mean, I think they understood that they were granting a pre-enforcement challenge, but um, uh, we'll see how it develops. Um, just maybe one or two other observations on the case. Um, we can talk about why the court limited the question to free speech, um, but one implication of that decision is that the arguments that are being made here 
aren't limited to religious objections to same-sex uh, marriages or to, uh, to sexual orientation issues, right? If, if, uh, if Smith is correct that there's a free speech right um, to selectively choose her customers based on the messages she wants to endorse, I assume I, I, that would apply to any protected characteristic. I, I, I think it would apply to a white supremacist who doesn't want to uh, provide services to people of color because that would be expressing a message of endorsement for their lives and um, uh, their accomplishments. Uh, and so that, that didn't you don't see very much about that in the briefs, um, but I'd be curious to see whether it comes up in argument exactly what the limitations are um, on uh, Smith's uh, uh, arguments. And then the other piece is um, Smith limits her position to artists. Uh, she says that um, she's looking for uh, an exemption uh, and, uh, for artists, and she, which she identifies as photographers, writers. Um, she does not include bakers on her list of, of artists. Uh, and there are so many amicus briefs filed in this case. Um, so many of them are just seeking to kind of figure out where you can draw a line on what's artistry and what isn't when you're talking about commercial sales. Um, I don't think there's really a dispute that the, the kind of graphic artistry and, and website design that uh, Smith does falls uh, into that category, but baking um, is maybe in a different category. And so, um, I, I, you know, given Irv's points about the uh, conservative leanings of this court, um, I, I don't doubt that a majority of the justices are sympathetic to Smith's position, but there's some, I think, really difficult questions um, on, on kind of the implications of ruling for Smith uh, and whether the court can find uh, narrowing principles, uh, both respect to um, kind of the, the rules it's articulating. And again, because the record here is so sparse, um, it's difficult to do something like you saw in Phillips where you, you based uh, the decision on the, on the record of this particular case. So I'll stop there. Comments from others? Yeah, I'll just say, I, I do think that regardless of ideological bent, there, there does appear to be a frustration of the court when they grant these cases and then they're all arguing about what the case would hold and what the case involves. And so they get, they get a little, I don't know, argumentative when they're dealing with facial challenges that seem to me have nothing to do with their perspective. They just get very frustrated when they don't know what they're dealing with. And the uh, cake case, um, you know, we teach it in law school because it was just a hypo, you know, wonderland. Um, it was just endless hypos. Um, Justice Kagan was at her finest with her list of, you know, let me give you 12 hypos. So it, it, this reminds me of this standing case where it took them like 10 years to finally rule. They kept granting and granting, and then they would see, oh, this is, you know, we can't figure out all the various hypos we have to deal with. So just watch, watch argument for the frustration. Um, I, look, I think there's a pretty interesting connection between this case and a case that's on a rocket to the court, which is the uh, social media case out of the Fifth Circuit. So, you know, in this case, the challenger is relying heavily on cases like Hurley, which is the case that said that the state could enforce uh, a parade to include uh, certain people in the parade that they didn't want to include, and cases like Torneo, which held that the state can't force newspapers. I don't have to tell you all what Torneo held, so I'll just stop there. Um, and then on the other hand, the, the, uh, the state is relying on cases like Pruneyard, which said that the state can force shopping malls to allow people to come in to uh, speak, and, that they, and cases like Fair versus Rumsfeld, that said that the government can force law schools to allow um, to allow the military to come and recruit. All those cases are the exact same cases that are being at issue in the Texas social media challenge. And for at least some judges, the dynamics of it are completely flipped, right? So in in the Fifth Circuit, what Judge Oldham held was he took a very broad view of cases like Fair versus Rumsfeld and Pruneyard and a very narrow view of cases like Tornillo and Hurley. And so it'll be interesting to see uh, judges who potentially want to rule in favor of the Texas law, but also in favor of the, uh, the store owner here, how they sort of navigate that tension. And I don't want to oversell it. Like, you can thread that needle, but it is a pretty interesting dynamic, I think. Anyone else? So um, let me just ask, uh, 
Um, last time, the argument um, was all about, or almost all about, in Masterpiece, um, who's an artist, cake makers and architects and uh, cooks and et cetera, uh, an endless stream. But I thought the, um, and, and florists, but I thought the, uh, the plaintiffs chose pretty wisely here. Um, and I just wonder whether uh, um, anybody's going to be uh, having any debate about what, whether graphic artists or artists um, like that generated that debate before, and will that cut off that whole line where the court will just say, well, we don't have to figure out any of that because for sure we've got somebody who's a speaker. I think now. Be, it's a slightly different problem now, right? So everyone agrees that there is a speaker, but as Kelsey was saying, the question is what's the speech at issue and how much of it is actually being compelled as opposed to what would have happened anyway. I think they're gonna be, you know, the lines that are getting drawn here, I think are gonna be pretty tricky. So for example, you know, Kelsey gave some of the hypotheticals, but you know, what about a hypothetical where the store owner would write, uh, the website designer would write on any website, God blesses this marriage, right? But the meaning of that message is very, very different depending on who's getting married, depending on what your beliefs are, right? So I think that that's where a lot of the tension is gonna be in a case like this over which aspects of speech are at issue and whether it's being compelled or not. And, and the other, uh, anybody can weigh in on that, but the other question that came up um, at argument in a, in a pretty uh, forceful way, and I'm sure will come up this time again, is whether the same rule applies to interracial marriage. And last time, at least, uh, both the Solicitor General, uh, Noel Francisco, uh, who you know well, um, and, uh, and, the, uh, and the plaintiffs in that case tried to distinguish, I think, um, race from sexual orientation. Um, do you think they'll, they'll do the same thing here? Or um, is it time to just sort of concede that, yes, our principle extends that far. I mean, it might depend on whether you get to scrutiny, right? Um, uh, I, I didn't talk about that when I was describing the case. Um, you know, the, the state's position is that you don't need to apply any heightened scrutiny because the law is directed at sales, which are not protected speech. If, if the court decides that some portion of this is that there is uh, that the that the law regulates uh, speech in some way, then you have to figure out whether it's intermediate scrutiny or heightened scrutiny, um, and then we start to get into kind of the fact that the court hasn't recognized um, sexual orientation as a as a uh, constitutionally protected uh, status. Um, so I I would guess they're not going to want to go down that road. I do think that this argument is going to be all about the hypotheticals similar to the masterpiece uh, argument. Uh, there was the birthday cake example in that one, right? Uh, when a baker uh, bakes a cake and writes happy birthday on it and someone takes it home, no one thinks that the baker is wishing anyone a happy birthday, right? They just wrote it, um, uh, which I think is a, is a good one. There's an interesting kind of back and forth in the briefs about uh, an exam uh, a hypo involving a Hindu calligrapher. So the, the opening brief says that under the law, a, a Hindu calligrapher would be forced to write uh, Jesus is Lord for a customer. And then the state's brief comes back and says, no, all the law requires that is if the Hindu calligrapher decides to offer the product stating that Jesus is Lord, uh, the calligrapher cannot then sell that, uh, that calligraphy only to one uh, a, a customer of a particular religion, religion and not another. And then the state, uh, Smith comes back in her reply brief and she says, well, what if the calligrapher wrote um, the one God is supreme for a Hindu celebration? Would, the Hind would that calligrapher then have to also write the one God is supreme for a Christian baptism? And that's where the conversation left off, right? The state didn't get a response. <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds like Hashi, so hypothetical yeah. <laughs> to me. Yeah. Um, so I will be interested to see how that plays out in argument as well. Press. You covered this a bit, Kelsey, but I was always confused about how to discuss this as a religious speech case or a full free speech case. Because it's always, you know, the backdrop of all this is about religion. But in the end, it's being argued as a, so do you think we should characterize it as a pure 
free speech case that really doesn't have much to do with religion and could affect all kinds of other, if I don't want to, I have a website and I don't want to work with Muslims or Jews or whatever, for entirely mean like political reason, this is going to help me. I don't, I did not see in Smith's briefing an explanation of how you would limit her arguments so that, for instance, they wouldn't apply to the white supremacist who wants to refuse to serve people of color because he doesn't believe in celebrating their lives. I, I, don't, I don't see that. Now, that doesn't mean that the court won't try to find it and that they won't be sorting through this at argument, um, but the, I think that's one of the consequences of putting this in the free speech bucket. Um, I think they didn't want to touch the religious exercise piece because that um, kind of it, it touches on questions of whether to overrule Smith, and maybe they're not all in agreement on that. But I, I suspect even if there are six votes uh, ultimately for Smith, there are going to be 12 different opinions on how you get to that outcome. And so I could, I don't think it would be surprising at all to see a really fractured decision here with different justices having different views about where you draw the lines. And ultimately, that could make it really attractive to, to kind of punt this um, because of the lack of, of record um, here, right? Uh, that's, that's creating probably part of the problem. We don't have a concrete dispute. Um, so I think this is really hard, even if you know, they granted it because of, of a sympathy to Smith's so, position. So I, I think the best way to think about this um, is this case would have never arrived at the court had it not been a religious objection. If the objectors were anybody else, a case like this never would have made it to the court. But once the case make it makes it to the court, then it's no longer about religion anymore. And um, it's about because the ruling can't be limited to religious objections when you pose it in First Amendment terms, uh, uh, free speech terms. So um, anybody else want to respond to the question? Other questions? Yeah. Um, the, in the last Masterpiece case, there was a lot of concern among the justices about shops putting up signs that said, we will not serve fill in the blank. Um, and in this case, the person very specifically wants to say that uh, on her website, right? Is that going to give uh, even the justices who might be sympathetic uh, concern? So I don't I don't think so, because I think the line that they would be distinguishing between is if you're not allowed to discriminate on the basis of status, right, then you're also allowed to the state's also allowed to prohibit you from saying you intend to engage in what is illegal discrimination. So if if the state could say you have to serve black people, you can't tell people I'm not going to serve black people. So I think those hypos, I'm sure the challengers will easily give up those. The question is whether they can put on their website we don't intend to serve someone who they have a First Amendment right not to serve. So I, I don't think the, me the additional message is what's going on. The question is whether are they discriminating on the basis of status, in which case everyone agrees it's impermissible, or whether they're discriminating on the basis on message, in which case that's the question presented in the case is, do they have a First Amendment right to, dis to not engage in certain messages? Yeah, and I, I oversimplified a bit when I described the public accommodations law because there are actually two pieces to it that are being challenged. One is the, the piece I described. There's a kind of a, a, a companion piece to it, which is this uh, publications clause, which prohibits businesses from advertising that they uh, discriminate based on a protected characteristic. I think both sides, if I've read their brief correctly, um, can agree that the constitutionality of the publications clause is going to rise or fall with the accommodations clause for the reasons that Hosh said. Um, it is interesting, though, you know, I don't want to project this onto the state, but, but from reading the briefs, my impression is um, the law would not constrain a business owner, as I said earlier, from um, very uh, prominently putting on their website, I do not believe in same-sex marriage. I do not support same-sex marriage. I, um, they can't say, I don't want same-sex uh, couples to come to me for services. That would violate the publications clause. But you can state your beliefs. And as I said, they can insist that every one of their wedding websites uh, expresses that belief as well. And so then the question becomes, well, what is the publications clause doing um, separate? Uh, and I think that then gets to just you know, the state's interest here is ensuring that all people have equal access in, uh, to the marketplace, that they can fully participate in our economy. Um, and so 
uh, you know, a business owner can say what they like about uh, same-sex marriage, but they can't prohibit um, uh, same-sex couples from, from accessing their services, so. As I recall, it was Justice Kennedy who seemed very, very troubled by that. And I think if he were on the court, he would still be very, very troubled by that. Um, but he's not on the court anymore. So the question really becomes whether anybody else is really, really troubled by that. And um, so I think the answer to that is, you know, a little, um, but not enough to make a difference. And so I think if, if, if I were looking at it, and maybe this was hot, what Hosh was getting at or not, but I think they would, the, the challengers would concede, we can't say we won't serve same-sex customers across the board. What we can say is we can't, we won't serve uh, same-sex weddings um, because that's the line between, in, that they're trying to draw between belief and status discrimination. And they concede they cannot engage in status discrimination, which would involve refusing to provide any service for a same-sex couple or um, based on sexual orientation. Yeah, and I think I think it was Justice Alito who made a similar point in his concurrence and masterpiece, if I'm remembering correctly. But it's the idea um, that uh, so here, if a gay man came to Smith and asked her to make a wedding website for his niece and her opposite sex fiance, presumably Smith would say, "Yes, I'm happy to make that opposite sex uh, marriage website." Um, and conversely, if a a uh, heterosexual woman comes to Smith and says, will you make a wedding website for my gay son and his uh, male fiance? Smith would say no. So in that sense, it does seem like it's based on the, the message as opposed to the status of the person who's asking. Um, on the other hand, I think that really hits up against Justice Gorsuch's opinion in Bostick, right? If you would make this wedding website um, and do, write it exactly this way, if the people uh, in uh, that your customers were opposite sex and not do that if they're same sex, that does... Um, feel very much like sexual orientation discrimination. So um, maybe we'll see um, some back and forth on that as well. Other questions from the press? Any? Yeah, I just wanted to ask, you talked a little bit earlier about the sort of the awkward position of this case. And I was wondering, you know, to what extent that's partially because there are six conservative justices at this point and any four of those can grant cert. I don't know. I'm always reluctant to guess what happens in conference. Um, uh, so I don't know. Do, do other folks have thoughts? No one. Yeah. I, look, I, I don't. I don't think there's any reason necessarily to believe that there's a subset of them that are more comfortable with pre-enforcement challenges than the others. Like that might be true. It might not be true. I just don't know. Well, maybe I'll say this: that that when we see cases like. Fulton and Masterpiece, and you know, Masterpiece was before the current makeup of the court, um, where there's a grant uh, and a case that could be a real blockbuster in terms of the consequences, and then the ultimate decision from the court is quite narrow. You might speculate that what happened was that four justices were eager to grant cert, and then once they had it, right, they didn't quite have the majority they needed um, uh, to, to reach the outcome they were looking for, but uh, I'm just, you know, speculating there. I just on pre-enforcement challenge, it, there used to be a you know pretty clean divide um, between the left and the right, where the left um, welcomed pre-enforcement challenges and the right was much more reluctant and um, standing focused on those. But really, I think over time that um, has lessened. And when it came to a case called SBA List, um, just Oops, the entire court seems to think you, you know, standing problems evaporate in pre-enforcement pre challenges, and um, you, you can get pretty darn speculative uh, in pre-enforcement challenges in a way that they wouldn't allow in other contexts. And I think it's just they all agree now that if you're subject to being prosecuted in one way or another for violating the law, uh, they're pretty much going to allow people to sue about that. But rather than having to engage in the conduct itself and be exposed to uh, prosecution. 
So uh, next up is Hosh, and he has the independent state legislature theory. Yep. So this is uh, Moore versus Harper, and the case concerns the allocation of authority within a state to regulate congressional elections. So Article 1 of the Constitution has a clause that's usually referred to as the Elections Clause, which provides that the time, place, and manner of congressional elections shall be prescribed by the state legislature, though Congress can displace those regulations with regulations of its own. Uh, and that concerns congressional elections, but there is also a similar provision that governs the presidential elections in Article 2 that says that the manner of appointing presidential elections shall be in the manner directed by the state legislature. So the question in these cases concerns, well, it says state legislature, so does that mean that do, do the state courts have the authority to displace laws enacted by the state legislature pursuant to the state constitution. And like I said, this case comes up in the context of congressional elections, but I suspect a lot of the public interest in the case concerns presidential elections. It's so all touch on that at the end of sort of what the implications are. Uh, so the, the case factually is pretty simple to describe, which is North Carolina after the census uh, redistricted their congressional maps, just like every state has to do and the General Assembly engaged in the redistricting, and then people who were unhappy with it challenged it as a partisan gerrymander. And after the uh, Supreme Court's decision in Rucho a few years ago, you can no longer bring that claim as a federal constitutional claim, so they raised it instead as a state constitutional claim. And the North Carolina Supreme Court agreed with them, uh, relying on various provisions of the North Carolina Constitution that are fairly general, things like requiring free and fair elections. Uh, the North Carolina Supreme Court said that the North Carolina Constitution prohibits partisan gerrymandering and that this map was a partisan gerrymander. Uh, the legislature then tried to draw a new map to comply with that ruling and the state trial court rejected the map and said it was still gerrymandered. And so then it adopted its own remedial map for the upcoming elections. Uh, and so the question in the case is the, the legislature is arguing that the state courts lack the authority to invoke the state constitution to displace their law because the elections clause says the state legislature. And the, uh, the other side of the case, the challengers and the state AG are saying that the mere use of the word legislature in the Constitution doesn't displace the ability of state courts to use the state Constitution to modify uh, what the state legislature has done. So to get into the legal arguments, I think I'll start with some of the just general background that I think all of the parties would agree with. So, you know, there are lots of provisions in the Constitution that refer to states, but there are several provisions of the Constitution beyond the ones I just mentioned that refer to specifically the legislature of the state. And I think everyone agrees that that difference in meaning presumptively has to have, that difference in language presumptively has to have some difference in meaning. And the question is how much difference in meaning? And in particular here, is it, do you have to give it the difference in meaning that means the state constitution can't be used as a trump? Now, there are some provisions of the constitution that as a matter of practice and existing Supreme Court precedent, everyone agrees has that feature. So for example, when state legislatures ratify federal constitutional amendments or under the original constitution when state legislatures appointed senators, everyone agrees that the legislature in those contexts is acting independent of state constitutional constraint. The state constitution can't constrain how the legislature votes to ratify constitutional amendments or appoint senators. And I think the theory behind that sort of delegation directly to the legislature sort of independent of state constitutions is that the framers wanted to vest the decision in people who are politically accountable to the people, but are not themselves the people. And if you could have the state constitution override them, then the people by constitutional amendment could basically displace the legislature and do whatever they wanted directly. So for example, with appointment of senators, the whole point of having the legislature do it is that framers didn't necessarily want popular elections for senators before the 17th Amendment. And if the state constitution could come in and trump that, it would sort of displace the scheme. Now, what's important is the examples I just gave you are all situations where the legislatures are acting in a not purely legislative capacity. They're doing things like appointing or ratifying. 
here, everyone agrees that the election clause contemplates that the state legislature will be acting in a legislative capacity by pursuant to ordinary legislation. And so conversely, everyone agrees that there are some state constitutional constraints on what the legislature does in this context. Everyone agrees in their Supreme Court cases that have held that they have to act pursuant to the ordinary means of enacting legislation, the ordinary procedures for enacting legislation. So for example, if there's a gubernatorial veto, they have to satisfy that. If there's a popular referendum, they have to satisfy that too. Um, and in a case a few years ago, uh, called the Arizona State Legislature case, the court held for basically the same reason. They said that when the people act pursuant to initiative, that is an act of the legislature, and they could, for example, delegate to an independent commission the authority to engage in redistricting. Now, that case was 5-4. Uh, Chief Justice Roberts issued a pretty vigorous dissent that was uh, joined by Justices Alito and Thomas and also Justice Scalia. And so I think one big question in the case is going to be to see how those three plus the new Justices Barrett, uh, Kavanaugh and Gorsuch view that opinion and the, the extent to which they're willing to apply it or narrow it or even potentially overrule it, which the challengers have suggested might need to be done. Uh, and sort of conversely, one important question in the case is going to be how whether people view state judicial review as part of the ordinary procedures of enacting a law, just like a gubernatorial veto. Uh, so obviously, in a constitutional case like this, there's all sorts of arguments about text, structure, history, precedent. I don't think that's going to be the most useful thing for me to sort of summarize here today. I think what's more interesting is this isn't a case where there's sort of a binary, either the challengers win or the, the other side wins. Both sides of the case have basically served up for the court a menu of options, sort of from broadest to narrowest. And so one of the things I'd be looking at in the case is sort of trying to see which of those options is gaining traction at the court, because I'll have pretty significant implications what level of gen generality either side wins at. So I thought what it would be helpful is sort of lay out what the menu is on both sides. So on the challengers, starting at the sort of broadest theory, it's basically what part of legislature don't you understand, right? Legislature means legislature, courts aren't legislatures, therefore courts can't override what the legislature does, and the legislature can't delegate its decision-making to anyone. Now, that very broad theory would potentially even sort of implicate whether legislatures could delegate to local election officials or municipalities how to run elections. And so I th the challengers pretty quickly back into a slightly narrower theory that wouldn't change the outcome in this case, but that would have a big difference for those sort of delegations. And they suggest, look, sure, the legislature can delegate to executive officials to implement its laws. That's fine. But what the legislature can't do is delegate to courts to override their laws. Uh, so that's sort of their second tier position. Then they back up from that further and say, look, maybe you could have a delegation to state courts to override state laws but if the constitutional provision is clear enough. So if it's a clear and specific provision, then sure, if you violate, if the state law violates that clear constitutional command, state courts can enforce that. But what they can't do is use these very broad and capacious provisions of state constitutions like free elections and use that to override what the state legislature has done. Because at that point, it's really the courts that are making the decision, not the legislature. And then their very narrowest position is, even if the legislature could delegate power to courts to override any and all of their decisions pursuant to state constitutional provisions, the General Assembly here hasn't done so. Yeah, they've authorized judicial review, but they've never authorized judicial review to invoke state constitutional provisions to trump regulation of federal congressional elections. So that's sort of the suite of options on the challenger side. On the other side, you have basically the same sort of four levels of position. The broadest position that the defenders of the North Carolina Supreme Court have urged is that state legislatures are creatures of state constitution. So, of course, when the federal constitution says the state legislature will do something, that means we'll do it consistent with what the state constitution says. Now, that position, too, sort of quickly runs into the problem of, well, what about the areas where the court has already held 
that state legislatures don't have to comply with state constitutions, like, for example, the ratification of federal constitutional amendments and under the original constitution, the appointment of senators. So the challenger, the defenders, the respondents, likewise immediately fall back to a slightly narrower position, which is in the context of ordinary legislation, an ordinary means of enacting legislation is having judicial review. And you could view state constitutions as an act in action of the legislature on the theory in Arizona state legislature that the people, when they enacted the constitution, were acting in a legislative capacity. And so that is part of the laws of the legislature. They, they too also have like a fallback position, which is even if you don't buy that, the legislature has authorized judicial review expressly. And so because the legislature has authorized judicial review, that is why invoking the state constitution should be viewed as regulating congressional elections in the manner prescribed by the legislature. And, their, and then their final fallback is whether con the General Assembly has delegated to the courts the ability to do this is itself a question of state law, which the Supreme Court can't second guess. So those are the sort of menu of options on both sides. Turning to the implications, I think the most obvious point is it's hard to say what the implications are until you know sort of which of those buckets the court goes into. Because on the one hand, you could see a very broad ruling saying that basically all state constitutional provisions are inapplicable in the, in the context of the regulation of congressional elections. Or it could just be a subset. Or it could be they all apply unless the legislature provides otherwise, or it could be they all apply regardless of what the legislature says. So there's sort of a whole suite of things the court can do. And one of the things to be watching for, I think, is where are they? And the fact that justices are seem skeptical of certain arguments one side is arguing doesn't necessarily mean they're skeptical to their bottom line. Um, the other thing I would say about the implications of the case is, you know, there's been a lot of talk about this case as involving, you know, the end of democracy and things like that. And I do think that's fairly overblown for a couple of reasons. One is when people talk about this case involving the end of democracy, what they tend to be focused on is the whether the state legislature could basically override the results of the election after they happen. And that they cannot do even if the petitioners in this case win the case on their broadest possible theory. Because the time of when elections are held, both congressional and presidential, is set by Congress. And no one is arguing that the state legislature can ignore the timing rules that Congress has adopted. Now, to be sure, the state legislature could adopt rules before the election about how the election will be adjudicated. But again, the respondents, agree. everyone agrees that the state legislature can do that. So the only question in the case is, can the state constitution constrain that choice? So it's a, it's a, it's a lot narrower of an issue, I think, than a lot of people have portrayed it to be. Now, I don't want to undersell it. It is quite important in terms of the rules of the road governing congressional elections, right? There are lots and lots of provisions of state law that state constitutions might say are unconstitutional. But there too, you know, whether you view it as the end of democracy depends on what provisions we're talking about. So on the one hand, for example, this case involves partisan gerrymandering and the state constitution has been used to say that you, have, you can't partisan gerrymander. And some people might view that as a pro-democracy result. But conversely, you could have state constitution provisions that say, for example, absentee balloting or early voting is unconstitutional. And those sort of state constitutional rulings, some people might think, are anti-democracy. So I don't think there's a clear sort of pro or anti-democracy balance to this. It depends on what constitutional provisions are at issue and what legislative issue uh, enactments are at issue. Uh, the final thing I'd say, as I mentioned before, is with respect to the presidency, uh, one interesting thing about this case, and it's sort of a weird decision that they granted it, is it won't necessarily resolve the status of the independent state legislature theory with respect to the presidency. And the reason why is something I started with at the outset, which is the president, the presidential electors provision is less, it's, it's more ambiguous about whether it should be viewed as something that the legislature is acting pursuant to ordinary legislation as opposed to the sort of things where everyone has always agreed they're acting pursuant to a non-legislative function, such as appointing senators. If 
the court were to conclude that the presidential electors clause is more like the appointment of senators, it's the appointment of presidential electors, then everyone agrees that the state constitutions don't trump that. And so even if the petitioners in this case lose, that doesn't necessarily mean resolve what happens on the presidential side, which is, you know, it's going to be a little tricky that they won't necessarily have resolved the presidential issue before the next presidential election. Other people want to comment? Yeah, I, I thought the way that Hash laid out the many of options was was really helpful, and I just want to focus on on one piece of that, which is the the fact here that the North Carolina legislature did authorize judicial review under these circumstances, um, and I I think you know I'll be watching an argument um, to see whether that that kind of uh, aspect resonates. I would think with the Chief Justice at least. We'll see if, if also with any of the other um, Republican appointed justices, because it's one thing to say that the state constitution can't trump uh, the federal constitution with respect to, to housing the authority in uh, the state legislature. But it's very different to say that the state legislature can't itself uh, authorize the courts to do this sort of judicial review. Um, applying state constitutional principles. Um, so I, I, I will say I'm hopeful, I've been trying not to express too many opinions here. I'm, I'm hopeful that at minimum that resonates with the court as, an, as a narrow ground for uh, ruling in North Carolina's favor. Um, what does that mean? You know, you could still have states that, uh, state legislatures could withdraw that judicial review from their state courts. Uh, and uh, so it doesn't solve that piece of the problem, um, but it's it's potentially a way to get out of this uh, case on narrow grounds, um, rather kind of than um, kind of blowing up <laughs> how we've always thought about uh, uh, the judicial review and state constitutions in this context. Um, yeah, I, th I think uh, I think Hash did a, a great job of, of sort of summarizing the issues, and I think I agree with with all his major points, um, which to me seem to be one. It's really complicated in terms of the possible outcomes, and the court has lots of options. Um, and I also agree with his bottom line that this case is sort of once you get into the it is one of those cases that once you get into the legal weeds of actually looking at the briefing and seeing what the parties are argue, uh, it seems like there's a there's a disconnect between those technicalities and the way in which the case has become a sort of politicized case in some of the public discussion. I think especially important and valuable for those of you who are writing about the case to kind of, you know, really tease out some of the nuances. I'll just throw out my sort of uh, gut level take on the case without having read the briefs, but having heard about the case now in a number of forums, it just seems to me that the court is not, want, is not gonna wanna hold that there's no judicial review at all. But the court is going to be, or a majority of the court is going to be concerned about situations in which they kind of feel like state courts are essentially rewriting uh, election laws um, in a way that really isn't what the, the framers of the Constitution had in mind when that, that power was delegated to the legislature. And so if, if both those things are true, what that means is the solution is going to have to be somewhere in the middle. And I think the court is going to want to, I don't think they're going to want to just like get rid of the case in the sense of not not moving the law forward or improving the law um, in their view of it. But I think they're going to have a hard time sort of articulating a clear rule. So I kind of expect something in the middle. And I wouldn't be surprised if it ends up with a rule that's going to be a little bit muddled and hard to apply in future cases. Um, maybe that that kind of result uh, is not, this wouldn't be the first time they do something like that. But uh, this seems like that kind of case to me. Yeah, I, look, I think that's right. And there is sort of a doctrinal path for that issue. Like this issue of what do you do when state courts are interpreting state law, which they normally have plenary authority over, but they're doing it in a sphere that implicates a federal issue. That comes up in a lot of areas. It's not just this, like it comes up for the takings clause because bounds of property are defined by state courts. It comes up in the contracts clause because obviously contracts are defined by state law. And in all those areas, the court has always had a sort of very mushy, difficult to apply standard that, look, we're not gonna second guess state law all the time. Like state law is what state courts say. That said, we're also not going to let state courts lie through their teeth about like what state law is to defeat a federal right. And how you draw that line is all obviously very difficult. And how candid you are about why you're drawing that line is also very difficult. Uh, and yeah, I could easily see this case being that sort of thing of, look, it'd be one thing if the state constitution said no partisan gerrymandering, but it said no free elections for 200 years. No one thought that had anything to do with partisan gerrymandering and like, 
you need to have something clearer before you displace the legislature it could easily be sort of where they end up. So I wonder whether um, we have some hints uh, about that that may be the direction in which um, at least some right side justices are going because at the stay stage, uh, Justice Alito uh, wrote for three um, and articulated, I think, some version of this theory that Hosh was just articulating and um, jumped right to the backup argument um, because, you know, he could have started with this broader argument but did not. And I wonder whether, to some extent, um, even though it was quite clearly dicta in the Rucha decision, um, every one of them signed on to the idea that state constitutions could, at least in some circumstances, uh, set standards for partisan gerrymandering. And um, it would be, you know, they could toss that aside for sure. Um, but it would be, um, I think, pretty embarrassing for all the people who signed that to just sort of jump on to the lead theory of, of the uh, petitioners in this case. And so what's left really, uh, which would be perfectly consistent, I think, with the dicta in the Rucho decision would be to draw this line between um, more general and more specific. I do think that that's uh, too rough of a line because, um, you know, the Supreme Court itself engages in constitutional interpretation of very general provisions, and they don't think they're legislating when they do it. Um, and so I do think the court has to be very careful in identifying when it is that, um, I think as Hosh put it, the, the, the court, the state courts are just lying about what their constitutions mean, and it can't be just um, because the provision is a general one. And whether, um, you know, it's interesting that only three people signed on to the uh, decision at the stay stage, which doesn't mean it won't acquire five eventually. Um, but it's also interesting that so little of the briefing is devoted to this topic. Um, and, you know, most of the, the action is elsewhere. Anybody else? Uh, press questions? Yeah. Um, so if Alita was hinting at that more narrow ground and, he, and maybe it comes out, this is a very, it's not the broad ruling, it's the narrow ruling. Do we know how that actually plays out when you look at state constitutions as far as how many of them have the specific language versus language that could be considered general. And on a separate note, is there something in the history of Kavanaugh and Barrett, maybe particularly Barrett, that gives you sort of an indication? Um, because I think she, you know, why she might not want to sign on to things here, maybe an originalist view or something like that. Uh, so on your first question, I don't know the answer. I, I haven't sort of surveyed what the sort, how many state constitutions have specific provisions about gerrymandering or other sort of election related issues. On the second, you know, I don't have any particular thing in mind. I, you know, with Justice Barrett, I could see her being more open to the broader theory, actually, if anything, right? Because the sort of the general view that legislature means legislature and can't be overridden by the state constitution, unless the legislature agrees to that, you know, it, it, it's, it was in various opinions in the sort of Bush versus Gore opinions. There's some er, other earlier opinions that say it. And it also, I just, I think it's the more natural reading of legislature that as between the provisions of the constitution that say state and the provisions that say legislature, the natural meaning is it should be the legislature that's acting, not sort of subject to the superintendence of other parts of the government. But, you know, I don't know for sure. I have no, I have no concrete reason to think that she would have that view, but I don't. You, you know, on the stay, uh, no, but I, I view that more as an issue about the stays in these cases rather than necessarily the underlying merits. I think just a couple quick comments. I think on the, uh, I think the textual question, the kind of legislature question is kind of interesting because on the one hand, 
you know, if you want to be very purely textual, as you see legislature, it seems to say, hey, legislature, we know what a legislature is. On the other hand, we do have a lot of precedent out there, including precedent about the role of the governor in the legislative process, a gubernatorial veto. You don't, I don't think it's a normal way to talk about a governor as being, uh, and, and, you know, if, the pre if President Biden vetoes a bill that was passed by Congress, I don't think we really think of him as being part of Congress when he's doing that. I think of, we, we think of him as being something that's, you know, being able to counteract what Congress did. And so, so we, although the text of the Constitution does use the word legislature, there's settled precedent out there for a long time that sort of recognizes that the governor has a role to play. And I think once you recognize that, once you recognize various roles that state courts have to play at all, then I think that the kind of textual argument sort of loses its, its force unless you're really willing to rethink the whole area of law. Um, so I think it will be interesting to see, you know, wh whether someone like Barrett or some of the other textualists really glom onto that, that purely textual argument. I think it's a little harder in this case because of that other precedent. With respect to Justice Kavanaugh, I do think one thing from his um, background that could sort of shape his thinking or inform his thinking a little bit is Bush versus Gore. I mean, he was obviously, uh, he was sort of there at that time. Um, he was involved in the Bush administration. I think that, that uh, folks who went through that litigation probably uh, think that the Rehnquist opinion that, that uh, adopted a version of some of these arguments that are going around about you know, when state courts go too far in this area, it seems very unlikely to me that, that those justices are going to be willing to say anything that would imply that Rehnquist was wrong in his opinion. And I think that sort of personal involvement and attention to this, this type of argument going back you know, 20 years, I think, is it could could inform uh, the way he thinks about it. There's two two other related things to that, right? So one is in Bush versus Gore, it's not just the Rehnquist concurrence in the second of the Bush versus Gore opinions. The first of those opinions, the Bush versus uh, Palm Beach canvassing or whatever it was, that was a 9-0 opinion that sort of remanded to the state Florida Supreme Court because they said it looks like you might have relied on the state constitution to trump what the legislature did. If you did so, that might be in tension with an old Supreme Court case called McPherson versus Blacker that says you can't do that in the context of presidential electors. Why don't you rethink it? So again, that's not a holding that they can't, but it's not just a handful of opinions. And then the only other thing I would mention is, I, I take Roman's point that obviously the mere fact that says legislature doesn't mean that no one can be involved. But I think one thing to look to see where the court is on is whether they're drawing a distinction between creation of law and enforceability of law, right? So when the governor vetoes or when there's a referendum, that's all part of creating the law. What's happening with judicial review is a step removed from that. Now we know what state law is. It's what the legislature has enacted pursuant to ordinary law. And then it's a question of whether that law is enforceable. It's sort of really similar to what happened in sort of the SBA litigation about thinking about where it is that when law is law and then the means of judicially reviewing that law are arguably different things. One thing I just wanted to add about this um, narrow theory is that you will also see a version of it in the uh, uh, Carter Phillips brief for the uh, judi judicial state judicial conference, I think. Um, he's not saying it was violated in this case, but I do think he's offering it. It's being offered as a way to think about when it would be appropriate for the court to step in. Um, it would be appropriate to step in if, you know, the this, this state court was just kind of making it up um, as it went along rather than doing genuine constitutional uh, interpretation. And um, I think that's a very, it's a very, you know, they've done it in other contexts, but to make this the kind of uh, recurring thing that federal courts should be looking at, I think is very, very tough. For the court to go down that path, but I would not um, rule out that that's the path that they'll go down. And then how that comes out in this case, I think we'll just have to see. I guess it just strikes me as maybe unpalatable from a federalism perspective, and I don't mean to predict what anyone's doing. I'm just my own view. Um, if the state legislature has decided to authorize the courts to do that sort of judicial review, it strikes me as quite intrusive for the federal courts to come in and say, no, no, they're not doing it the right way. They're not interpreting your state constitution the right way. Wouldn't it be up to the state legislature to say, 
uh, okay, now you've gone too far, courts, you're applying the state constitution in a way that it, it goes beyond its text, and so we're gonna take that judicial review power back from you, but. Yeah, no, that seems right. like, and one, a lot of this can be about default presumptions, right? And so, like, one way to handle it is say, no, that's right, like, once the state legislature gives it to the courts, like, it's gonna, because it's so hard to draw the line, we're either not gonna draw it all or we're gonna draw it very narrowly. But on the flip side, we're gonna require pretty clear evidence that the legislature actually delegated to the courts in the first place. And so, you know, in this case, yeah, there's judicial review and yeah, there's judicial review of constitutional claims, but nothing in the federal, in the state statutes, I think, says the state legislature can apply the state constitution with respect to congressional elections, right? So one thing you can argue, which I think the petitioners have argued is, that's not a clear enough delegation to get it into the courts in the first place. Other press questions? Lisa, on Indian adoptions. Yeah, I just wanna make clear, I have no opinion on that case, but I'm holding uh, Hosh in the light. That was an epic, epic presentation, Hosh. Um, so I have the ICWA case, which will be argued on November 9th. Uh, this case raises the constitutionality of the Indian Child Welfare, Welfare Act, ICWA, referred to as ICWA. It is brought by the state of Texas and a group of adoptive couples who want to adopt children covered by the act. So the key is what the act applies to. It applies to child custody proceedings involving a, quote, Indian child. And that definition sweeps in any minor eligible for tribal membership who has at least one biological parent who is a tribal member. And so that's the whole case sort of turns on this definition. Uh, the challenges are that the act exceeds uh, Congress's power under the Indian Commerce Clause, violates the 10th Amendment by uh, commandeering state courts and state child welfare agencies, violates the non-delegation doctrine by incorporating tribal law, and contains race-based preferences that violate the Equal Protection Clause, which I will focus on because I think that is the area that will be of interest to your readers. I'm going to give a, a pretty extensive background because it it's really what the whole case kind of revolves around. Uh, this law was passed against a very disturbing and tragic history of the wholesale removal of Indian children from families um, to assimilate them into white culture based on prejudice, prejudice about uh, Indian culture. It started with the Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, putting all these kids in horrendous boarding schools and then it then transitioned in the 60s and 70s to state custody removal proceedings resulting in 25 to 35% of all Indian children being separated from their families and something like 85% of them uh, placed in non-Indian homes. So Congress's response, it was in 1978 to pass this law. It contains very detailed procedures for the removal, custody and foster and adoptive placement of Indian children that applies in store, instead of your normal state custody law. So briefly, the act does three things. The first is it gives tribal courts exclusive jurisdiction, regardless of the parent choice for Indian children domiciled on an Indian reservation. So that means regardless of what the mom and dad think, uh, where they want their this litigated, it would be in tribal court if you're domiciled on a reservation. The second is it imposes a battery of procedural and substantive safeguards for state child custody proceedings before Indian children can be removed from their biological parents. And third, which is this case involves, it mandates in section 25 USC 1915 that absent good cause, adoptive and foster home placements be made preferentially in the following order. One, the child has to go to members of the child's extended family, but that's defined by tribal law or custom. Second, other members of the same tribe. And third, most relevant here, any other Indian family, even if it's a completely different tribe. So these provisions obviously do an enormous amount of good and have remedial effects, but the preferences can cause an enormous amount of heartache when non-Indians enter the mix, either because one of the parents is not Indian or because there is an adoptive family in the background that is not Indian. The court, and I use that phrase because that's the phrase everyone's gonna use at argument, and that's the phrase in the act. The court has only had two cases under this extremely important law. There are hundreds of adoptions that take place uh, involving this um, law, 
and it is, a, it is an enormous amount of, uh, of importance to people who uh, adopt children or want to give up their children for adoption. The first is Holyfield. It's a case from 1989. Justice Scalia has called this case the hardest case he's ever decided. Um, and it'll, it'll tell you why. It, it's very, these cases are so emotional to talk about, but two unmarried Choctaw members who lived on a reservation traveled 200 miles from their reservation to give birth and give up their child, twin babies, to an adoption for an adoption of a non-Indian couple that was approved in state court. The tribe complained because the parents were obviously trying to circumvent tribal court jurisdiction, and the Supreme Court agreed and ordered the unwinding of the adoption, even though the children had been living with these parents for three years. The court, quote, said, we acknowledge that separation at this point would doubtless cause considerable pain, but the tribal court had exclusive jurisdiction to decide where the children should go. I think it's only fair to point out that the kids, I think by the time, maybe they were five by the time the tribal court actually decided the case and the court left the children with the adoptive couple. The second case is adoptive couple versus baby girl, a case from 2013 that I brought on behalf of a non-Indian white couple seeking to adopt a child from a Hispanic mom who selected the adoptive parents. The father had relinquished his parental rights but changed his mind when he found out about the adoption. It was too late under state law, but the baby was three over 256 Cherokee and so was an Indian child who triggered the act's application. We brought the equal protection clauses, equal, equal protection challenges that are brought here, but the court 5-4 sided with us on statutory grounds. Uh, this case took me over three years to get over the emotional toll. The child had lived with the adoptive couple for the first 27 months of her life, then the birth dad for over 18 months in the tribe when the court decided the case and the child was eventually returned and is still living with the adoptive couple and is now a teenager. At the argument, Justice Kennedy was pretty apoplectic that the court even took the case. He was like, I don't ever want to see this kind of case again. But here we are. Similar stories have continued uh, back and forth with children being transferred in and out of foster homes and disputes involving non-Indian parents. And now we have a full frontal equal protection attack on whether that Indian child definition and preferences in the act are race-based preferences. If they are, they're obviously unconstitutional. You can't tell people that they can adopt children based on their race. Here are the things to watch. First, Morton versus Mankari is the landmark case. It upholds the uh, Indian preferences by the Bureau of Indian Affairs for employment preferences that are, that are limited to tribal members. The court held that this is a political distinction based on subject to rational basis review and is not a racial preference. Other preferences involving uh, the title of, uh, I don't know whether it's title eight, but an entire US code have been consistently upheld. The one exception is Rice versus Cayetano, which invalidated a uh, Hawaiian law under equal protection where the voting was restricted to non-Native Hawaiian Americans. It is significant that then John Roberts was on the losing side of that case. He was representing the state of Hawaii. The parties have joined issue on the following legal issue, whether the classifications are political because they, quote, promote tribal self-government and quote, fulfill the government's special responsibility to tribes. If they do, the court will dismiss the equal protection clauses. If they don't, they're going to strike at least the provision involving the preference from an Indian child to any member of any tribe, even if it's not the tribal, the tribe's member. Second, the 5-4 couple from adoptive from adoptive couple versus baby girl has materially changed. We no longer have Justice Breyer who sided with us, but we also no longer have Justice Scalia and Justice uh, Ginsburg who were in the dissent in that case. We have the emergence of Justice Gorsuch, which is consistently ruled in favor of tribal rights and tribal law, and Justice Barrett replacing Justice Ginsburg. And Justice Ginsburg sided with the uh, birth dad and the tribes and adoptive couple. I think the assumption is that the United States that's defending the law with the support of, of the tribes has at least four votes. Uh, assuming that uh, they have Gorsuch's vote. And that leaves the challengers needing to pick up both Justices Kavanaugh and Justice Barrett. The third point is I don't expect to see the same level of fireworks and emotions at argument, uh, mainly because I'm not arguing the case and Justice Scalia is not on the court. But Justices Barrett and Roberts are adoptive parents and uh, non-Indian ones at that. And the entire subtext of the law and the case, and it's not really a subtext, it's 
just out there on the surface. And the whole story of the tribes and their amici is that children with Indian blood are psychologically better off being raised in Indian families, even if from a different tribe. White culture is bad for them, and the tribes need these kids to sustain their existence. Number four, Native Americans are considered racial minorities in the affirmative action cases that we talked about from the beginning. They are a underrepresented minority expressly in the North Carolina plan. Now the US has argued and presumably will argue that there's a difference between a pre preference given to a Native American student and a preference given in this case to a child who's who is eligible for tribal membership and has one biological parent who um, is a tribal member. But I have to question whether Congress, in the name of tribal preservation and a special relationship to tribes, could raise the penalties on just tribal members who abuse Indian children or murder other tribal members, or manda man mandated mission preferences at law schools and medical schools for students meeting the definition of an Indian child, just based on the fact that their education or their health would dramatically improve self-government and sustain the existence of tribes. Thank you. Other comments on this case? I'll just say, I thought Lisa did a great job um, kind of describing the history because obviously the law was was really well-intentioned and um, is important in, in many respects. I think what's so difficult about this issue, and Lisa touched on it when she talked about the two prior cases, um, is that there aren't any rules you can adopt here that aren't going to lead to enormous heartbreak in specific situations, um, right? There, there, there's always going to, in any particular case, so you hear the story about the family, you're going to say, oh, obviously that child should stay with the adoptive couple, that's, she's bonded with them or so on, or that it's, uh, in this case, you're ripping the child from the Indian um, community and 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 I I I, I suspect the justices are going to be uh, grappling with that. I think in in baby girl um, the case that Lisa argued um, uh, the narrative there was pretty powerful um, in the sense that you had a mother who had been um, abandoned by the biological father and she had made a choice about uh, placing the child with a, an adoptive couple. So there was almost this kind of reproductive rights element uh, to that case. Um, I don't know that that's what was um, uh, compelling uh, Justice Alito's instincts or anyone else's, but um, that was uh, kind of the narrative there I think was important. Um, and so I will be interested to see an argument how much the narrative um, matters in this case. Um, and I mean, I think all of the justices are probably inclined to want to avoid heartache, um, but I don't know that there's an answer here that, that does that. Yeah, the, there's no uh, issue about which kid goes where in this case. Um, there is one about a sibling, uh, but the challengers weren't dumb. They picked cases where the child had no connection with the Indian family and was designated a enrolled as a child, as a member of the tribe in the hallway at a settlement conference. So the whole narrative that we brought, in addition to my reproductive rights angle that attracted nobody, um, was that um, there's a difference between the breakup of an Indian family and just the accretion of tribes and just treating children as property and natural resources that you should hand over to tribes to kind of increase their population. Other press questions? Yep. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, this is not obviously the same area of law, but how do you think the majority's approach to tribal sovereignty in Castro Huerta from last term is going to factor into this case? Well, then that's how the votes are being counted, The starting from Carpenter to McGirt to uh, last term's case, where, you know, since adoptive couple, half of Oklahoma has been declared uh, Indian country then the court in a 5-4 decision, and then another 5-4 decision involving the change between um, Justice Ginsburg and Justice Barrett. The court walked back that decision with respect to criminal jurisdiction. So, uh, I mean, and Justice Gorsuch wrote a quite scathing dissent. So I expect, uh, I mean, that's, those are the vote countings that are being going on is where Justice Barrett fits in. Um, I don't, Justice Kavanaugh, you know, I don't know. It's very hard I mean, from somebody who watched the adoptive couple case 
from the argument in Holyfield, there was such a much more personal element in adoptive couple. Justice Scalia literally openly talked about how a child should be with the birth dad over an adoptive couple. I mean, it was extraordinary. So I, I don't know if we'll see the same level of that kind of emotion at this argument. Other press questions? I guess I just have one um, to add is, which is, you know, it's very strange, this area of the law, um, when most tribal membership depends on the percentage of blood that you have um, for it not to be called racial, um, even when there's tribal membership. So what is the line here that, um, needs to be drawn between something that seems racial, um, but the court has accepted as not racial, at least in some contexts. So for what it's worth, that has never bothered me here, because the analogy I would draw, and I think the SG made this point in their brief, is like, for example, if you have nationality-based distinctions, right? You know, if you're from certain countries, you get treated one way, from other countries, you get treated a different way. That's a nationality distinction, even if that foreign country has citizenship rules that turn on blood, right? Like you're, you're more able to become an Israeli citizen if you're Jewish, things like that. No one treats any of that as religious discrimination for purposes of federal law, just because the foreign nation citizenship rules itself turn on race or religion, right? And that's essentially the argument that they're making here is foreign tribes are, uh, tribes are viewed as foreign governments or you know, domestic dependent governments and their citizenship rules turn on blood, and that's fine. Yeah, the, the problem with that argument is this involves custody and children and parents. You've got biological parents who may or may not be Indian who have their child that they want somewhere versus a government. And so it, it would seem odd to be talking about, well, I'm three-quarters Texan and one-quarter Alabaman, and therefore you know, people from Texas are better off raising their children in Texas than shipping them off to Alabama. It just feels very strange to talk about citizenship criteria with benefits and foreign affairs when you're talking about adoption. Irv, your point on the, the race issue is talked about in the briefs, and I think, Justice Kavanaugh, this came up in the, um, the Oklahoma case. The tribes have said it's not racial because we've allowed freedmen, uh, former people who were slaves, into our tribes, and the other side comes back and says, yeah, because of court ordered you to do it. You actually, because of blood quantity, refused to let uh, former slaves into your tribes until you were ordered. So there's a lot of that back and forth going on in the briefs, too. Um, so we have very little time uh, left, so I am going to do a very abbreviated version, unfortunately, because we have a hard stop uh, at 11. I'm at, on, on um, Warhol versus Goldsmith, and um, I'm going to assume uh, familiarity with the basic uh, facts, uh, which is that, um, and just say that uh, Lynn Goldsmith is a, a photographer whose body of work includes uh, famous musicians, and she took a photograph of Prince, um, which is then um, used by Warhol to create a Prince series. Um, he eventually um, allowed the images or licensed one of the images without Goldsmith's uh, permission to um, a magazine and um, Vanity Fair and its parent, actually. And um, there was then a suit for infringement. And the question is um, based on fair use. There are four fair f use factors, the first one of which is um, the one that's at issue here and uh, turns on the purpose and character of the use. Uh, the question on which the court granted cert is whether a work of art is transformative and therefore satisfies the first factor when it conveys a different meaning or message from its source material. Uh, Warhol says the answer is yes. A change in meaning um, or message is transformative and satisfies the first factor. Uh, and it argues that such a change occurred here because Warhol transformed the Goldsmith's image from shy prints to iconic prints. Uh, Goldsmith says a change in meaning or message is not sufficient to satisfy factor one. The copying must be necessary to some distinct creative end, and it may not supplant the original. 
That test was not satisfied, she says, because Warhol's orange prints did not comment on Goldsmith's original. There was no need at all to use the photograph for any distinct purpose, and the Warhol works supplants the original because they're interchangeable in the marketplace. Um, the key case here is Campbell, and I will quote the key line uh, that the parties are debating which says, quote, the central purpose of the investigation into factor one is to see whether the new work merely su supersedes the objects of the original creation or instead adds something new with a further purpose or different character, altering the first with a new expression, meaning, and mes or message. I am going to pass over arguments about how to diagram that sentence and whether it should be informed by its parody context. I'm also gonna pass over what to make of Google's reference to a soup can. And I'm not gonna discuss the common law uh, other than to say, thankfully, Roman and Lisa, despite Bruin, spared us mercifully from too much of it. And finally, I'm not gonna go into the exchanges on text and structure. Instead, uh, in the time left, I'm gonna highlight four questions the answer to which I think will be most on the justices' <laughs> mind. Um, two, I have drawn from the Warhol brief, and two, I have drawn from the Goldsmith brief, and frame them in their terms. Question one, will Goldsmith's standard destroy copyright protection for numerous works of modern artists who have engaged in the time-honored practice of appropriation? including Warhol, Lichtenstein, and others. Question two. Will you don't want us to answer these questions? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like you to Question them. two. Will Goldsmith's standard make it illegal for museums, foundations, and galleries to continue the displays of culturally significant works that draw on pre-existing works? Question three. Will the meaning or message standard decimate the existing right over derivative works? For example, would it make it easy for a movie maker to take someone else's copyrighted novel and change it around just enough to escape the novelist's copyright protection? And question four, is the meaning or message standard too subject to manipulation and too inherently subjective to be a workable way to determine something as important as copyright protection? It is the resolution of those questions rather than the usual text history, et cetera, that I think will determine the outcome of this case. And I invite comments from the panelists. <laughs> I, I really, those are actually exact, those, that, that was an excellent identification, I think, the four key questions. I, I'm, I am really curious to see uh, what Lisa and Roman think about that. I, I don't. I, I'm not a copyright guy, and so I don't have a whole lot of instincts about it, other than to say the you know the, the question about whether it's necessary to engage in the copying seemed to have some sort of intuitive force to me, but it also wasn't at all obvious that that's how the doctrine's really ever been applied. We're not going to have an oral argument here. I think. I, I, yeah, I just want. I mean, <laughs> I, I'm looking to see if the justices understood any of the references to art and pop culture in the briefs. The nice thing about the briefing in this case on both sides is that there are a lot of pictures. If you like pictures, good briefs to read. Um, I think I'll leave it for October 12th. <laughs> but uh, but uh, it's always fun to be with uh, Lisa on this panel, and it'll, it'll be maybe slightly less fun to be at argument with her. But I'm sure it'll be a uh, spirited exchange. Yeah, I, I will say the briefing is excellent by the parties. <laughs> <laughs> Any press questions? Thank you, everyone, for being here, and uh, see you again next year.